Okay, and welcome. I hope people are joining and can join. Uh, welcome to the very first Research Ed Home, which is something we never expected to do in a million years. Roughly at this point, I think we had uh, 15 research ads coming up over the next six months, uh, many of which have been since been cancelled. What we've decided to do in the meantime is to try to make it the best of the situation. And in conjunction with uh, the wonderful Matt Hood and Helene and many other people, we've decided to put on a series of online research ed uh, sessions, webinars, CPD, whatever you want to call it, and use that as a way of trying to make something good out of a very difficult situation. Um, I wish everyone peace and health, wherever they are just now, in these unprecedented times. And I hope to see everyone face to face in happier times. But in the meantime, let's make the best of what we can. And let's do the best we can with the resources that we have. And what we've decided to do is to line up uh, a series of, of, of daily sessions that Matt will explain to you in, in, in more detail in just a second, for people to log in, join in, listen, take part in, and hopefully ask questions live to some of the, the greatest voices we can find globally in education to discuss evidence-informed education. For those of you who aren't familiar with the research ed concept, what we are is a, as a, a non-profit, um, free at the point of access uh, organization, where we try to bring greater evidence usage into the, the, the field of education. Not because we think we have the answers or necessarily where we think things are going, but because we think that the, the more we use evidence, the more we can drag ourselves out of somewhat of a dark age of education where whatever anybody thinks goes and everyone's opinion is equally valid. I think we can do better than that. And I think the children and teachers deserve better than that in the UK and everywhere else around the world. I think it's been a very exciting time to be in education because we've started to see a global community of educators starting to link up through events and initiatives like Research Ed, uh, where they can discuss, share, question and query what evidence bases are available to ask and answer some of the best questions that exist in education. And once again, this isn't about deciding this is what we think and these are the Research Ed answers. This is about asking more intelligent questions so we can ask better questions in the future. I'm delighted you could join us. Thank you for giving up your time. Um, and we have got an inspirational cast of people to, 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 uh, to, to listen to over the next 50 or 60 days. Um, starting off with perhaps one of the most inspirational of all and a, per and, a, and a personal inspiration of mine, Daniel Willingham. So I hope that you listen, watch, enjoy, take notes, share, let other people know about it. These will be available later on to, to, to download and to watch. Um, and I must stress that all the participants in this program have given their time and their expertise for nothing. This is a completely pro bono project. Nobody benefits from this. And I think that's very much the attitude and spirit which we will continue this in. And I think it's unique to education and I think it's unique to what we're trying to do with the research ed. I'm now going to pass over to Matt Hood who will explain to you a little bit more about how it works. But thank you for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and uh, welcome, everybody. There's uh, just over 500 of you uh, who have joined us today, which is incredible. Um, uh, so this is the bit of the research ed where um, somebody stands up at the front who uh, explains to you where the toilets are, uh, what's going to happen with lunch, uh, how you get coffee. Um, uh, not today. All of those things are entirely your own responsibility. So hopefully you can find your way to your own bathroom and uh, get yourself a coffee. Uh, no lunch, unfortunately, provided uh, today. So no little vouchers to worry about. Um, I'm just going to walk through a couple of the like housekeeping things, though, for how Research Head Home uh, is going to work over the coming uh, term. So at every day, um, in the main at 11 o'clock, I want to stress that bit, in the main at 11 o'clock, there are a couple of exceptions, so do keep your eye out for those. We're going to have a speaker um, from the world of education talking about a topic uh, where they have particular expertise. Um, you're really welcome to join uh, every day. And uh, as Thomas said, this is entirely free and uh, everybody is generously giving their time uh, and no individuals benefit. Um, we release those speakers. So who is speaking a week in advance on our Twitter page. So please keep your eye on that Twitter page to see who is coming up uh, next week. 
Um, you can join us live for these uh, presentations. The major advantage of that is being able to ask and answer questions uh, with our speaker, which we will do at the end of the session today. And you can also watch again. So we're recording these sessions and the link to watch again, again, will be posted in the spreadsheet that's pinned to the top of the uh, Twitter um, account. So um, you can join live or you can watch again later. You can share those links and anybody uh, can see them, which is fantastic. Um, the format today, uh, in a moment, I'm gonna hand over uh, to Dan, which is an enormous privilege and I'm incredibly excited about. Um, if you look in the bottom of the uh, screen, you'll see a Q&A chat function. Um, please do post questions and answers in there, uh, either towards the end or indeed at any time during the presentation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna collate those uh, throughout and then I'm gonna post some of those questions to Dan uh, that you've got at the end of his presentation. And we'll get through as many as we can in the time that we've got available. Um, as a, uh, with any good lesson, uh, we need to stick to time. And so we will make sure that we're wrapped up by midday uh, today. So without any uh, further ado, um, uh, I'm gonna hand over now, uh, incredible privilege to uh, Dan William. Dan, over to you. Thanks so much, Matt. And thank you, Tom. Um, Absolutely delighted to be here, honored to uh, that everybody is uh, willing to um, spend some time with me. Uh, so in thinking about, sorry, I uh, thought I had that going. Let's see, there we go. Uh, in thinking about an appropriate topic for, um, uh, <laughs> for the amount of uh, schooling at home that's happening now, uh, I thought about uh, this one here, as you see on the slide, reading critically about internet sources. And this is, of course, something that uh, we're concerned about at all times, increasingly in the last uh, couple of decades, as we ask students to do more and more research on the internet. So here's the uh, list of topics that I'm going to take up over the course of the next 50 minutes or so. A uh, brief tour of how well students seem to be doing in analyzing and evaluating research over the internet. Uh, that, that, those data will not surprise you. Uh, and then I'll draw a distinction that psychologists have used for many years in the persuasion literature um, when they're considering why someone believes something or doesn't, the difference between central cues and peripheral cues. Uh, and then I'll close, uh, assuming I've got some time, with some particular challenges um, uh, to belief for particular topics that um, are usually quite emotion laden. So let's start here with uh, how our students are generally doing when it comes to evaluating sources. Uh, when I think about kids sort of doing some research on their own, of course, think about my old own childhood and where uh, the bulk of what we did was go to the library. Uh, and the library, of course, was uh, carefully curated and so it was uh, there was very little chance that you were going to run into wildly inaccurate information uh, naturally some stuff was published uh, even uh, back in the good old days of my childhood that was not accurate but for the most part uh, the librarian was sort of on top of what what I had access to uh, that of course is not the case anymore but there's an argument to be made that maybe kids today, having grown up as digital natives, this is not such a big problem for them. They're used to encountering sort of the Wild West on the internet. They never know what they're gonna find. And so they're much more skeptical uh, than I was as a child. Uh, we know that the whole digital native idea is not really accurate. Um, one way that this has been examined is to look at the idea that because kids are growing up with technology from a very young age, they're much more sophisticated in their use of technology. Uh, we know that's not true. And in, in fact, when um, kids are asked to uh, learn a new uh, platform or learn how to use a new app, they're no, actually no faster than adults are. If they seem more adept, that's because they have greater access to resources to learn uh, how, to, uh, how to use new technology, and also because uh, they're mo typically more motivated than older people are. When it comes to evaluating information, uh, as you see the figure here, 60% of middle and high school teachers think that today's technology actually makes it harder for students to find 
credible sources. So the idea that um, did being a digital native offers some protection is really not flying with, uh, with teachers. Uh, and indeed, there's been quite a lot of uh, research conducted over the last 10 years or so showing that um, they're actually not very sophisticated in using and evaluating informa information sources they find on the web. I want to spend a little bit of time with a terrific study that was published last year. This was spearheaded by Sam Weinberg and his uh, group at Stanford. As you can see, over 3,000 US high school students participated in this study. And uh, what made it so nice is that partly that they, they had this large uh, sample that was representative of US high school students. But also if you look at the uh, tasks that they asked students to do over there on the right side of the slide, these are exactly the kinds of tasks that um, we would like students to be successful at. Evaluate whether a video posted on Facebook uh, is good evidence of voter fraud, explain which of two websites a better source of information on gun control. It's exactly the type of evaluation that we really want to see. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of, of what students were asked to do. Uh, and how they did at it. So this one, using any online sources, explain whether a website is a reliable source of information about global warming. So this was an actual website uh, that you can find today. And students were just on the internet and they, uh, they were told like, you can, you know, you don't need to stay on this website. You can go off of this website um, and use any resources you can find. Tell us whether or not this is a good website. Uh, and this was, this was the website they were asked to evaluate. And it looks like it's about uh, climate change science. 96% uh, of the high school students failed to identify this as a climate change denial site, which is funded by Exxon and various coal companies. Uh, here's another example. Evaluate whether a video posted on Facebook, Facebook is a good evidence of voter fraud. Uh, this is the original video. This is not what students saw. It was published in The Guardian and other places. This is actual voter fraud. Here you see someone stuffing a ballot box. Uh, these videos were taken by security cameras uh, throughout Russia, and it showed uh, different instances in different polling places of uh, of voter fraud. I think you get the idea. Uh, how, many, how long can you watch people shoving paper in a box? Uh, this was what subjects were asked to evaluate. So they weren't shown the original photo. They were uh, filmed. They were shown a doctored version of that film that took out the reference to Russia and uh, said that these uh, instances of voter fraud were happening in various spots throughout the United States. And then someone had posted this doctored um, uh, doctor video on Facebook with this headline, have you ever noticed that the only people caught committing voter fraud are Democrats? And so this was what uh, so students were asked to evaluate. Uh, and again, the, uh, the original was available on, uh, on the Guardian website and elsewhere. 52% uh, of high school students said the video is strong evidence of voter fraud. 25% rejected the video, but not because they knew it was fake. They said, well, it's, you know, this is not a very good video. It's grainy. You can't, you don't, can't necessarily um, uh, see what's happening. Uh, it looks fake. And then 23% said that, accepted the video as evidence, but they said, well, you can't really draw that conclusion based on um, uh, widespread voter fraud based on that video alone. I'll show you one more example. This is relatively simple. Explain whether the tiles on the homepage of a website are advertisements or news stories. So this again is um, a genuine homepage for Slate.com, which you might know is uh, owned by the Washington Post. Uh, the big red numbers are the tiles that they were asked to evaluate. Uh, students were pretty good at seeing that number one was an ad, pretty good at correctly identifying number two is a news story, but two thirds of them missed number three and thought that this was a news story. And of course, what they've missed is the word sponsored content, or they either missed it or they, they didn't know what that referred to. Uh, and so they misidentified number three as a news story. Okay, so that's where we are. And again, not a huge surprise. You probably thought, yeah, this is something that a lot of our students find really challenging. Um, now, this distinction between central cues and peripheral cues, I mentioned at the, uh, at, at the top of the lecture, 
this is a distinction psychologists draw when you're trying to uh, persuade someone, when you're interested in whether or not belief is going to change, central cues refer to the facts of the message and whether or not people are assembling the facts of the message in a logical way, whether it seems to make sense to them, whether they think that the facts of the message are indeed factual. Peripheral cues refers to anything that's not really about the message, but that you nevertheless pay attention to and think is important in terms of whether or not you end up being persuaded. So let me address each of these. I'm gonna talk about central cues only briefly. Um, when we think about central cues, uh, we, we're really asking whether or not we can get students to teach students to be good thinkers. So we want students to go on the internet and we want them to uh, evaluate sources and sort of assemble them logically and, and think about whether or not uh, things make sense. When we think about central cues, and here's one of the more famous fake news headlines from the last uh, US election, Pope Francis shocks the world, endorses Donald Trump for president. Um, when we think about central cues, one of the really important protectants against false belief is knowing something about the subject that you're reading about. So for example, if you knew that uh, no uh, pope has ever endorsed a U.S. presidential candidate, that, that, would, that would prompt some doubt here, uh, to say nothing of the fact that if you know something about the, the beliefs of each of these uh, two men and the behavior of each of these two men, that would probably uh, prompt some doubt in you as well. So when we think about central cues, that, that, that's really what would, uh, the most important information uh, that, that students could have is, is having some knowledge about whatever it is they're reading uh, would be very important in helping them to, uh, to evaluate um, what they encounter. Now, this idea of being a good thinker, this is uh, still um, pitched as, a, as an important idea and something that is really achievable. Its latest incarnation is uh, the 21st century skills movement. Uh, so here's a quotation from Ken Kay, who's the, um, uh, I think now has retired from that post, but was the head of the 21st Century Skills Collective in the U.S. Instant access to facts, schools are able to reconceive the role of memorization, focus on higher order skills, and then the second bit, they really, what they really need to know how is to access data and evaluate it and so on. Um, this is a perennial idea. I mean, in the late 19th century, this is why students studied Latin. The idea was that um, the orderly nature of, the, uh, of Latin grammar would uh, bleed over into other thinking tasks and it would make you a more logical thinker. Um, this is really one of the great successes of uh, educational psychology in the early 20th century is showing that this widely held belief was not true. Studying Latin makes you good at Latin. It doesn't make you a more logical thinker. Uh, this idea got a second wind in the 1960s when instead of Latin, students were supposed to study computer programming and that would make them generally good thinkers. Um, and then once again, research show that that I did in studying computer programming makes you good at computer programming. Uh, and there's probably a little bit of bleed over into certain types of uh, other uh, closely related technical work. Um, so this is a perennial idea that keeps coming back, um, but most of critical thinking is, is not really a standalone skill. Uh, we can't find sort of a magic task that if you study it, you'll become a good critical thinker. It's much more uh, accurate to think of uh, critical thinking as intertwined with knowledge. So let's talk about peripheral cues because these are the cues. Naturally, what we really want is central cues. We really want when our students are um, evaluating a topic, we really want them to already know something about the topic and be able to evaluate the likely validity of a source based on um, uh, having some knowledge of the topic. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. And so most of the work in this area has focused on peripheral cues. Uh, so I'll get into a little bit of detail on this and talk about the types of peripheral cues people use offline when they're uh, not um, evaluating online sources, and then compare that to peripheral cues that students use when they're online, and then attempts to teach how, students how to use peripheral cues and some new and better attempts to teach peripheral cues. So let's start with 
the peripheral cues that people use in real life. Uh, and this is work that goes back to the 1950s in persuasion. One of the important peripheral cues is attractiveness. Um, we are all of us more likely to believe uh, people who are telling us something when that person is more attractive. I know it seems funny, and by the way, um, for all of these peripheral cues, if you ask people, like, so if someone is attractive, are you more likely to believe them? Everyone, everyone responds the same way, which is, well, I'm sure other people are, but, you know, I'm too smart for that. Uh, but we're all, we're all affected by this, though we'd, we'd like to think that we're not. Uh, we're also more persuaded by someone who is an authority. So if I'm uh, thinking about buying a tennis racket and Roger Federer tells me that uh, this particular tennis racket is good, uh, that's actually fairly good reason for me to believe him. There's reason to, for me to think that Roger Federer is an authority when it comes to tennis equipment. Um, it's less logical that I believe Roger Federer when he uh, recommends other products to me. So his prowess in tennis, there's not much reason for me to think that that makes him an expert in coffee. Uh, but again, all of us, though we'd like to think we don't do this, all of us do attribute some, uh, some authority across fields. The last peripheral cue I mentioned is uh, social proof. Um, uh, it's ironic in these days to see these people not social distancing, old photo, obviously. But social proof means if I see lots of other people uh, believe something, then that's some uh, evidence to me that there's probably fairly good reason to believe it. So uh, one classic example is if you see lots of uh, a, a line of people coming out of a restaurant, you figure that restaurant is probably pretty good, it's reasonable to suppose that those people know what they're talking about. All right, and this is, that's not an exhaustive list, but this just sort of gives you an idea of the, uh, the sort of thing we're talking about when we talk about peripheral cues. So what do they look like in the online world? Well, attractiveness still matters. So people are more likely to believe websites that look attractive, look professionally put together, as opposed to websites that look really amateurish and, and look like the person who put it together didn't, didn't really know what they were doing. Curiously, people don't pay attention to authority uh, when evaluating websites. So this is an example of a study. This was um, a couple hundred college students were presented with this problem. You're at home in the middle of the night. A friend calls you frantically on Friday at midnight. The condom broke while she was with her boyfriend. What can she do to prevent pregnancy? Well, once again, students, um, as they are in so many of these studies, uh, students are tested one at a time. They're sitting in front of a computer. They've got access to anything on the internet and they're uh, you know, sort of presented with the challenge, find some useful information for your friend. Uh, and what they found is when people found websites and they were asked, okay, so you're gonna tell your friend this, how do you know that what you're telling your friend is accurate? Uh, the author of the websites and the credentials of the person who had authored the website were mentioned only about 10% of the time uh, when saying this is a reason I think this is valid. Uh, and the verification of this credentials never happened. So they, uh, if they did mention, well, this person is a physician, and so they probably know what they're talking about, they didn't really uh, verify whether or not the person is actually a physician. Another uh, really interesting finding and quite consistent is that people use something like social proof uh, in that they use the search position, the, the position in the, um, the, that Google returns from a search. Uh, people rarely um, get off the first page of hits from Google. So those first 10 or so um, websites are where people tend to dwell when they're searching for information. Uh, here, as you can see, I've, um, I've, I've conducted a search for speed reading. Speed reading is not really a thing. You can't, you can't actually get any faster at speed reading. Um, but from this uh, um, web search, you, you, there's not a great chance that you would find that out because most of these uh, hits uh, are guiding you towards speed reading courses. Um, so there's, uh, instead of evaluating information, what, what uh, people are doing is they're sort of leaving that to Google and they're saying whatever Google returns as a uh, prominent hit, I figure is, is, probably, is, probably a, um, is probably a valid site. The final thing that um, people are very interested in, in, in doing these web, search, web searches 
is whether or not the the website is just sort of about the right thing. This is something that doesn't have a correspondence in real life. Uh, so this was um, where a student was confronted and asked to um, get health in, health related information about chocolate. Uh, and the student found this website that she thought was really terrific and had uh, really important information about ways in which chocolate was really healthy. So the interviewer says, what's your opinion about this website? It's great. Oh yeah, why is that? Because it's really detailed, has lots of things related to chocolate, about the history and health and different types of chocolates and recipes. And it turned out this was um, a uh, website that had been put together by a consortium of co chocolate producers, uh, unsurprisingly. But what I'm drawing attention to here is that the uh, student thought that it must be valid because it has the information that I was interested in. I was looking for chocolate information, it has lots of chocolate information. Therefore, uh, I think this website must be pretty good. So in summary, what students do is they attend to the design, they attend to search position, they evaluate a website as good if it's relevant to what I was hoping to find. What they don't attend to is uh, the source that came up with the website, the trustworthiness of the source, and they don't, and I didn't show data on this, they don't coordinate information from multiple sources. They find something that they think is good, and then they, they sort of go with that. All right, so here's the way that most of this work has gone in terms of trying to make students better consumers, which is uh, you, of course, um, don't really take on the central cues idea that, that well, you, know, you, you need to teach them some stuff and then they'll be better at evaluating it. That's not really what, in fairness, that's not really what this is about. Instead, you're trying to get them to use better or peripheral cues. So here's a table showing, you can see on the left-hand side, these are um, various citations of researchers who have come up with schemes where you give particular peripheral cues that you think are going to be um, lead to more valid reading of the web. And you teach students to use these peripheral cues, and then you give them tests, questions at the end, you know, some good websites, some fake websites, and see whether or not uh, they do better. Uh, so uh, along the columns on the top here, you can see, you know, get them to pay attention to who authored it, who hosted it, what the credentials are of uh, whoever's behind it, and so forth. Uh, what, uh, oh, and I'll also mention um, prominent organizations like Common Sense Media and Facebook sort of do the same thing. They're, they're telling you things like be skeptical of headlines, look closely at the URL, investigate the sources and so on. So they've got their own ideas about how to uh, try and make people more sensitive to better peripheral cues. Most of what uh, I've just shown you it has been successful in getting students to understand there's a problem. The, the most generous assessment you could say about the success in getting them to make better judgments is some of them seem to work a little bit. They're pretty good at getting students to sort of recognize and admit, oh yeah, there's a lot of misinformation on the web and I personally am susceptible to it. So this is, this is an issue for me. I better, I better pay some attention to it and figure it out. Um, but they're not especially good uh, in most of these studies in evaluating information they find on the web. On this question of peripheral cues, I want to uh, uh, close with uh, the suggestions of Sam Weinberg. So uh, he's the one who headed the, uh, the study that I showed you at the top of the lecture um, that I said was quite good that came out last year. And as part of this, his group has also um, looked at ways to make people more sophisticated in their valuation. They came up with a very clever idea. What they did was they brought in people who are professional fact checkers for newspapers and magazines with the idea that what these people do all day is they have content in front of them on which they're not experts, right? They, do, they don't really know very much about the content and yet they are supposed to be responsible for figuring out whether or not what's in the uh, article in front of them, whether or not that's accurate. So they um, brought people in, uh, these professional fact checkers, and had them do some fact checking and then talk to them while they were doing it. Why are you doing that? What are you doing now? That sort of thing. And they came up with a list of suggestions uh, that is proving quite useful. And so the group has started to do some evaluations with college and high school students uh, to teach them how to do what fact checkers do. And the early results have been really promising. So here are some of the things that they describe. First thing to do is to teach students to read laterally. 
Uh, and what that means is what students have a tendency to do when they're told here, now here's this website, tell me whether or not this website's any good. They tend to, they don't, uh, they, they tend to go deeper into the website and look at more and more details of the website. What Weinberg means by reading laterally is the fact checkers, when they were presented with a website they were supposed to evaluate, almost the first thing they did was leave the website because they reasoned what's gonna happen, if I look at the website, uh, I'm just looking at, if it's meant to deceive me, I'm just looking at more deceptive information. This is really not gonna be useful at all. Uh, so here's one example of a website that students were asked to evaluate in one of Weinberg's studies. Uh, they were shown the Employment Policies Institute, um, and they were, so they were, a lot of the content on this is about the idea of minimum wage and whether minimum wage is ultimately um, helpful or not helpful for the economy generally, but especially for uh, uh, for workers. And you can see the argument here, businesses are closing because of the fight for $15. So the idea that businesses can't afford to pay minimum wage. And so uh, it, it's ultimately a bad idea. So when they're asked to evaluate the Employment Policies Institute, uh, what a lot of students do is they go to the About Us. And then when you look at the About Us page, it, it totally looks legit. It's a nonprofit research organization dedicated to public policy issues, blah, blah, blah. And what Weinberg points out is if, if you just do a Google search of Employment Policies Institute, one of the first hits you'll get is a Wikipedia article that says it's a front group created by a Washington DC public affairs firm that lobbies for the restaurant, hotel, alcoholic beverage and tobacco industries. So you get a, this lateral reading gives you a very different view of what this website is all about. The second uh, suggestion from Weinberg's group is to teach what he calls click restraint. So this is just this idea that when you uh, Google something like learning styles, um, you're going to see a bunch of hits initially don't necessarily click the first thing that you see. Try to uh, do some evaluation, look at more um, websites than the ones that you see on the linked on the very first page. And again, just as with speed reading, uh, there are some um, uh, websites, some links here that really will lead to valid information. There's a lot of them that will not lead to valid information uh, on this on this first uh, page of hits. Finally, Weinberg encourages uh, the wise use of Wikipedia. Uh, I think people are much less leery of Wikipedia than they were 10 or 15 years ago. I, I feel like, it, and this is just all anecdotal experience on my part, but I feel like a lot of teachers felt like Wikipedia, you know, it's crowdsourced, anybody can write anything. Um, and so there was this feeling that a lot of the information on Wikipedia is probably not reliable. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and rightly so, I think that attitude is is really on the wane and and people are more willing to let uh their students use wikipedia as a source though that <laughs> would, would all rather they didn't only use wikipedia they look elsewhere as well um but weinberg says it is important to think about using wikipedia wisely and he offers these two ideas one is to look at the references uh don't just look at the main article but look at what they're citing um, not not just as to see whether or not they're citing valid sources, but also as ideas for other, um, other places you can go to get information. And then also to look at the talk tab, especially if you're uh, a little bit suspicious about the validity of what you're reading. Um, so it, the, the talk tab is here. We don't always look at it. We usually just look at the main article. That's the default. But the talk tab uh, is where people are discussing the content that you see on the main article and whether or not uh, it should be edited and whether or not it's valid. So you, you get interesting uh, information about validity that way. So those are the suggested uh, more effective peripheral cues. The, uh, I want to close with um, a brief discussion about some topics that are of particular concern uh, in, in evaluation. And, and that is um, a, a very strong set of findings over the last 30 or 40 years uh, in persuasion showing that people are not motivated solely by a desire to represent the world accurately. Uh, so when we think about belief, when we think about belief, especially about ourselves, why do I believe what I believe? We like to think that 
we believe things because uh, they are, we want our beliefs to be in tune with what's really true out in the world. And therefore, we uh, construct our beliefs out of facts and um, out of sort of the logical assembly of facts into conclusions. That's what we like to believe about ourselves. Uh, this is not true. We have other, that's one motivation. We, of course, uh, it's important that our beliefs be roughly correlated uh, with what's true out in the world, but that's not the only reason that we believe things. I'll give you just a few examples of other reasons we have to believe things. Uh, and I bring this up because um, it's sort of highlighting that when your students study particular topics, especially topics that are emotionally charged, there are other factors that are going to contribute to whether or not they believe a website. Uh, and, and indeed, this is true again, not just of students, but of all of us. Uh, so one function for beliefs is that beliefs protect values that we think are important or values that we even think of as sacred. Uh, so here's John Locke. Now Locke had a particular view of uh, humankind and, and uh, therefore really a, a view of childhood as well, that uh, humans were capable of being unkind to one another and um, government exists to sort of protect us from ourselves. Uh, and that, that translates into attitudes towards schooling as well, that um, schools are uh, serve a very important function because human nature is uh, at times uh, not that attractive. Um, schools are very important in shaping children and, and uh, making them into uh, happy and flourishing and well-educated adults. Compare that to Rousseau's view of human nature, where Rousseau thinks of children, uh, humans as um, much more inherently good. And instead, when we see problems in adults, that's really because they've been corrupted by human created institutions. So far from schools being important in helping uh, create uh, happy and flourishing and uh, uh, adults who contribute to society, uh, schools are really part of the problem. Uh, and if you would just get out of students' way, then you're more likely to uh, end up with, with, a, happy, with a happy adult. Um, the, the idea of uh, sort of a nature metaphor is very prominent in Rousseauian thought. Children are, are like flowers and you know, like a flower, you just need to provide some minimally um, uh, nourishing conditions for the child to uh, inevitably sort of grow into uh, something beautiful. I came across this uh, in the context of persuasion. I came across this attitude uh, very forcefully in a discussion um, regarding curricula several years ago uh, when New York State um, published a bunch of curricula and made them freely available to teachers. There was a first grade curriculum that included information about the Fertile Crescent uh, in first grade lesson plans. And so teachers got into this pitch battle uh, about whether or not it was developmentally appropriate to introduce children to information about ziggurats and mummies and pyramids and, and things that were quite alien to their experience uh, as early as first grade, uh, with some people saying like, it's fine, they're, you know, they're, uh, they, they like it, they're excited, I've taught this content. And then others saying this is developmentally inappropriate. And one of the lines that you heard frequently was, why can't you just let kids be kids? So it started as an argument, and this is, this is where I want to show this contrast between um, arguing about facts and how facts should be logically assembled and how this bumps up against what people consider to be sacred values. So you start with an argument that presents as could children learn in a useful way about a culture that is in a very distant time and place when they're in first grade. And people arguing, as a matter of fact, they are cognitively incapable of doing that. That's not going to happen. And then other teachers saying, I've taught kids this content. It went fine. And in fact, I foolishly jumped in and said, there are actually curricula that have been used for many years, including the Montessori curriculum, um, that teach kids about this content. And it seems to go fine. And in fact, the kids enjoy it. Um, 
that's not really what the argument was ever about. The argument really wasn't about the facts of cognitive development. Um, the people who are arguing this shouldn't happen and making the argument, why can't you just let kids be kids, had a view of childhood um, that, that this sort of leave them alone, let them do what they naturally want to do. This is their last chance to ever do it. Uh, when you see that, it's, it's so beautiful. That's what this argument was really about. This argument wasn't really about cognitive capacities of kids. I'll give you a couple more examples of functions that beliefs serve. Uh, beliefs are also important for regulating emotions. Um, so this is important work from the last couple of years about climate change. Um, so in this experiment, they took a, ex experimenters took a paragraph that sort of laid out basic facts that uh, scientists more or less agree on regarding climate change, uh, and then sh shaped the par paragraphs in two different ways. In one way, uh, they basically tried to make it really frightening and sort of grab people by the lapels and say, look, this is really serious. Like the, the, a lot of ecosystems are gonna be destroyed if we don't do something quickly and, and basically suggesting that the, the situation was quite grim and, and things were pretty far gone. The other paragraph presented the same facts uh, but in a, a, a softer way, and then also ended on a hopeful note and said, but you know, it's important to recognize it's not too late. We need to take action quickly and the action may be fairly extreme, but we absolutely can arrest this and, and turn things around. The thinking was it, you know, that it, the, the first message might be more persuasive because you're, you're sort of communicating the urgency. You're not soft peddling it. You're saying, look, this is serious. Like we really need to get after this. Uh, but what researchers found was that it was actually the second paragraph that was more persuasive to people. And the reason is that when you confront people with a reality that if I accept it, that's incredibly frightening, uh, people just reject the facts. You know, no one's going to say to themselves, well, I'm, I refuse to believe this because believing it would be terrifying. Instead, they're going to go to work to cognitively figure out reasons that I don't need to believe this, um, reasons that I can dismiss it. So this is why when you have just a few scientists who are denying what 97% of the scientists say, you get people who are clinging to those scientists and saying, well, it's all, it's all pretty up in the air. It's all pretty controversial and nobody really knows what's true. Uh, that's probably what you're seeing there. You're seeing people using belief to regulate emotions. I'll give you another example from an interaction that I had uh, <laughs> arguing with people on the internet, not uh, always a winning strategy. Um, but this was about whether or not it was okay for uh, children in elementary school to have gay teachers. Uh, and so I, I've been talking with this person, I've been saying like, you know, whatever you believe, like there's just absolutely no evidence that the sexuality of a teacher has any impact on kids at all. I don't, I don't just don't see why this is it. So again, we're arguing about the fact of the matter and the, the initial arguments were um, that this, this person was uh, laying out was that it's not good for children. They're going to, you know, I don't want my kids to be gay and stuff like that. And I'm saying like setting aside whether, uh, you know, <laughs> let's leave alone your, your goals for your children. Uh, but there's no evidence that what you say is true is true. And then here comes this comment. You must understand children follow the example of adults and older generation. If you truly believe you're creating good moral citizens by permitting gays, you are wrong. They mean no harm to your children. The way they act could affect your children morally and physically. All of, so again, all of this is just sort of denying what uh, I've been providing evidence for. But then this is where it really takes an important turn. You don't realize you're taking away their innocence, slowly twisting it into something that is not right. Disgusting. And what that made very clear to me, and I should have realized it earlier, was we were never arguing about the facts of the matter. This is, a, this is an, an argument for this person that's based purely on emotion. Um, and the, the word disgusting is, I think, especially uh, telling there. And that's a whole other literature on um, uh, problems that people have thinking about other people's, um, other people's lives that we're not gonna have time to get into. Uh, so in summary, um, 
the ways that we can really make kids more effective, first and foremost, know something. I want to, uh, I haven't mentioned that other than to say like, that's a really important way to be good at evaluating a website is knowing something about the content. But of course, the main problem we're concerned with is what if you don't know something? This idea of lateral search, what do other people say about the source or about the topic? Very important. Click restraint. Uh, wise use of Wikipedia, right? So these three all from uh, Weinberg. Um, and then finally, um, recognize that when kids have deeply held beliefs, existing beliefs, um, none of this is really gonna help that much. Uh, and it's probably going to require much more um, hands-on intervention from you to help students think through ways of getting at um, uh, reliable information about a topic that they feel really passionate about. So I think I'm going to leave it there and oh, stop sharing my screen. And I think we, uh, we've got some Q&A, which, but I, but I believe, I'm, hi, Matt. I believe hi. I am not um, regulating that, right, Matt? You're going to hop on here and- I am. And so we've uh, got some questions coming in, which is fantastic. Dan, thank Perfect. you for that. And we've got about 15 minutes or so to get into them. Um, I'll try and uh, curate a little what's coming through and, and pass them over to you to, um, to answer. Um, so so the, um, there's a question from Toby here about, uh, and this is uh, sort of 10 to 11 year olds, there's a couple of sort of towards the sort of younger end of the, um, the schooling system here, which uh, is sort of an interesting dynamic to play in. So, like we're, we're setting a research task uh, for pupils based on everything you've just said, like what are the sorts of things that teachers should be thinking about if they were going to set that sort of task for pupils, like practical sequencing things that you think they thought process they should go through. So let me, let me make sure I understand. So the, the question is sort of where to begin with this sort of problem for students. Yeah. So what would be your top tips for setting a research task for 10 to 11 year olds based on the, based on what we've just heard? That's a great question. And it's not one that, that I've thought about. And, and it's usually one I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but uh, I think normally what I would do is just punt on this because I would say uh, someone who teaches 10 to 10 and 11 year olds day in and day out is gonna have a much better idea of an appropriate task for them than I would. Um, the, other, the other thing I would, I would say is that this sort of task, obviously you want it to be integrated into the rest of the curriculum and exactly what an appropriate task might look like will probably depend on what else uh, children have already done and then where they're headed. Um, in, in most schools in the US that I visit, um, 10 to 12 is, is sort of, um, they wouldn't have had much experience. They would just be starting to doing this sort of exploration on their own. Um, and so I, I would think that the, you know, you would really be starting at the beginning and one of the, one of the tasks might be, and again, it all depends on what experience they've had, uh, is showing them, acquainting them with the need for caution. Uh, and um, we, I talked a little bit about um, data getting high school students used to this idea. Uh, but I think one of the first things they need to learn is that you you can't believe everything that you find. Um, so I would, and there, you know, a, a typical task um, that's been set, and I don't know whether there's a website like this that's appropriate for that for that age. But there are websites that are sort of spoof websites that are frequently used to uh, for high school students. Uh, to have you invite the student to evaluate the website, say, what do you think of the website? And then you show all the ways in which actually this website is inaccurate. It's, you know, there are significant problems here. Um, one of the best known is the, the one that introduces readers to the Northwest Tree Octopus, uh, which is supposed to be a conservation website for this octopus that lives in the Northwestern US and lives in trees uh, instead of in the water. Um, and it's it's a funny website if you uh, if you if you have a little bit of knowledge about the uh, 
um, about wildlife, uh, but a lot of kids go for it. And that one's been used frequently to sort of introduce kids to the idea like, look, it looks really well put together. It looks persuasive, uh, but it's actually inaccurate. Um, and I would, again, I would, I would think that this is uh, sort of first on deck for kids is to recognize that uh, this is something you need to be paying attention to. Great, thanks. Um, so a question from Rahima. Um, you talked quite a bit there at the end about the emotional biases that might come into play when um, you're making decisions. Is there anything that teachers can do uh, to help children and recognize or put aside those emotional biases? Like, can we tackle that problem head on? It's important to try. It's, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult problem. Um, this is something that, you know, there's been a big branch of social psychology, really post-World War II. After World War II, and um, in particular, a, a lot of the um, urgency for this work was generated by the Holocaust and recognition that um, you know, bias and prejudice against uh, fellow human beings had such uh, unbelievably horrible consequences. And that, un unfortunately, of course, has continued in the decades since. So there have been lots of psychologists very concerned with, um, with bias. There, there, there's certainly no guaranteed way to do it. Uh, one of the most standard um, uh, prescriptions is contact. Um, just getting to know individuals for, you know, if you're, if you're talking about bias in particular um, against, against uh, people, um, getting to know people of that uh, race or ethnicity or religion or whatever it is, um, is usually the, uh, the most effective method that people know when it's, uh, or have found. When it's other sorts of um, beliefs that you have a very, very strong political belief and you're trying to get people's mind open to the idea that, well, there are other ways of viewing those issues. Um, the same technique usually applies. Meeting someone who has those issues, getting to know them, recognizing, um, you know, but I, I like, critically, I like this person. Uh, you know, I generally, and I esteem them and I, I think they're, um, you know, they're bright and uh, pleasant to be around and so forth. And, and yet they hold these beliefs that I think are crazy. Um, there's absolutely no guarantee that's going to work because sometimes people will just seal off that belief. It's like, oh yeah, Matt's a great guy. He's got this kooky belief, but you know, otherwise uh, he's, he's really wonderful. Um, but it, meeting enough people like that is sort of the prescription for eventually opening people's mind. So, you know, when you're a teacher, I think you are really in a position to um, you know, because you're in a position of trust and if, if you've got a good relationship with, with your student, you're certainly in a position to contribute to uh, that work long term. Um, but you also should recognize that you're, you're, you're addressing a very difficult problem. Um, and you, you can't be too hard on yourself if, you, if, if, if you're not completely successful. Great. Um, uh, so there's a question from Marcus here. Um, you say our pupils need knowledge before they research something and read internet sources. How do we give them this knowledge without guiding them too much or giving them the answer? I'm sorry, give, uh, could you say that again? I didn't get which knowledge uh, um, Marcus was talking about. So you say that pupils need knowledge before they research something right. and read internet sources. Yeah. How do we give them this knowledge without guiding them too much or giving them the answer? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a, um, um, a problem in the, you know, throughout education is, is, and it's not just like knowledge and preparation for the internet. It's like, how do we balance uh, making sure that students have the knowledge that they need with um, uh, some experiences where they're doing the inquiry on their own? Um, so I don't think that that's particular to knowledge that's sort of in preparation for exploring on the internet. I think there's, there's a constant balance to be struck. Um, and I, I don't think that this is a, uh, I, I wouldn't think about uh, knowledge in this context any differently than I would think of it in any other context. You're constantly trying to ensure that um, students are actively engaged, they're thinking, and you're, you're not just saying, okay, here, this is true, this is true, this is true, and I'm gonna try and make that fun and interesting for you. You also want them 
um, putting things together themselves um, and finding that balance. I mean, that there's been enormous uh, um, emphasis on this within research ed. I've heard so many talks where people are talking about different ways of thinking about what that balance is and, and how to find it across curricula and, and also within individual lessons. Um, so that's what, that's the way I think about that issue. A question from Jane. Um, are there any risks of deliberately exposing pupils to uh, viewpoints that are factually inaccurate. Uh, I don't want to get too much into what those might be because one person's view on those is again they're different to us. But let's take the the world's flat. Uh, like, are, are there risks of like deliberately exposing people to demonstrate uh, that something is is definitely inaccurate? Yeah, interesting question. Um, I think that I think there I think there has been research on that and I cannot recall definitively sort of where that research literature has gone. I think generally if you, it, it, everything depends on sort of how it's presented. If you say like, hey, here's this really fun idea that actually the world is flat and there's been this enormous um, uh, sort of con game by the world governments to convince us that the world is round but actually it's flat. Uh, that's quite different than presenting it as here's this belief that's kind of funny and here's all the reasons it's wrong and let's explore why it is it might be wrong. So in other words, I think, I think critical to this is uh, the way that this false belief is presented. I think there's some risk if it's uh, um, not, not presented carefully and with uh, in the context of how you would evaluate an argument like this. Um, and as we're heading towards time, I'm going to uh, finish. Um, uh, Tom is going to be very proud here, clapping behind his muted screen. Um, uh, if uh, you were going to leave people today with some further reading on things that they could read that might be interesting to them in this space, um, and just a flag, there is a box on our spreadsheet connected to the Twitter account where we can uh, pop these links if they're not there already. And um, what further reading are you going to recommend to the 500 odd people we've had on today uh, where they can find out a bit more? I would probably direct them to um, uh, Sam Weinberg's website. So Stanford History Education Group. They also do terrific work in, in history curriculum, but a lot of it is focused on US history. Um, but that's where, that's where this work has, uh, I think, by far the best work in evaluation of internet sources has been taking place. I drew very heavily on, on Sam's work today. Uh, so that's where, uh, that's where I would send them. That's where we should go for, to find out a little bit more. Um, uh, Dan, just want to say a huge thank you for you for taking the time today to uh, come and speak to us. Um, I know that it is real crack of dawn where you are, uh, so appreciate the early start. Uh, you've done a great job of not uh, caffeine refueling throughout, which is uh, way ahead where I would have gotten to. Um, uh, and I'm just going to hand back to Tom to say a thank you and, uh, and goodbye to everybody. Yeah, I just want to say that I was mesmerized throughout that entire session. I, I was on mute so my, my children could come and, come and go forth. Um, Dan, a huge thank you to you for, for investing your time. The online reaction was tremendous. Uh, we maxed out our participants almost instantly, um, which is a lesson for us there. The video will be available to, to download online later on for other people. But Dan, you know, as ever, you've been so generous in your time. And I just want to emphasize that Dan got up at stupid o'clock this morning to deliver this at a time which was agreeable for people in Europe. So we'll need to repay the favor at some point. Dan, I don't know what you're doing for the rest of the day, but thank you so much. Matt, thank you so much for putting this together.